to restaurants. But back to the office? Well, yes and no. We believe the time is now um, to bring folks back into the office, uh, to bring them together. Brian Williams is the founder and CEO of Cadre, a real estate investment firm in New York City. His employees are back in the office three days a week. I do think that there's no replacement for in-person mentorship, training, guidance for younger employees in particular. I don't think you can replace that virtually. You don't get that serendipitous sort of uh, brainstorming, talking about an idea, and then whiteboarding it uh, virtually. On the other hand, we are fully remote and have decided that this is going to be our posture going forward. And we feel very strongly that it is simply the future of work for a lot of knowledge workers out there. Jeremy Stoppelman is the CEO of Yelp, the business review service. As the pandemic ebbed, he gave his 4,400 workers the option of coming into the office. But they didn't show up. It was something like 1% utilization in all these beautiful offices that we had set up. And nobody came in? Which makes sense. They save on commute, they have more flexibility in their day, they can spend more time with their family, have more time for activities. Like a number of other big businesses, Yelp gave up most of its office space around the country. And that wasn't the only benefit to the bottom line. What we've seen from our employees is productivity has sustained at least as good, if not better. And in fact, our revenue is now higher than it was pre-pandemic. Here's where I get stuck. There are other companies, as you know, who have looked at the same data and drawn exactly the opposite conclusion. Everybody's got to come into the office. Yeah, I mean, it's very confusing to me. We're suddenly able to tap into and hire employees in all 50 states, for example. In fact, we do now have employees in all 50 states. That was impossible in an environment where we were trying to get people into offices. In my mind, if you're not going remote or seriously thinking about it, you're missing out on one of the greatest free lunches in business. Well, it's true. Remote workers get to live anywhere. They can adopt a more flexible schedule, and they get to avoid the commute, the office politics, and some of the childcare headaches. But it's also true that meeting at the office can be better for spontaneous collaboration and mentoring and building a corporate culture and cultivating a social life. Maybe that's why some companies have gone virtually all remote some companies require your full-time presence in person, and others request your presence a few days a week. I think we're going through a phase where I would call it an experimental phase. There is no major in the MBA school that I'm, a, I'm aware of that has a, how do you have to change your culture, your recruiting strategy, your supply chain, all at the same time. Steve Cadigan is a workplace consultant and author. My advice right now is to really not make a decision for now and ever after. We are this. We are remote. We are going to be hybrid. I don't think you can because you don't know how this is going to play out in six months. If you ask any executive search firm right now, when we call a candidate, the first question they <coughs> ask is, is the job remote? The virus presented us for the first time in history a moment in time where everything was hit, hit pause and everyone stood back and looked at their reality from a different perspective. Gosh darn it, I love shopping on Tuesday and not having to elbow people at the grocery store every Saturday and Sunday. How do we keep people productive, but then how do we keep them from not leaving? You know, with the great attrition, the great resignation, we're seeing a lot of talent leave the workforce in record numbers. Brooke Weddle is a partner at McKinsey, the consultancy. She says that since the pandemic started, the balance of power between management and workers has radically changed. 40% of employees are considering leaving their work in the next three to six months. That is a hard figure to not take seriously as a CEO. And that's not just service jobs like wait Across staff. the board. This conversation ultimately is about, are your workers happy? Yeah, and, and what drives happiness? I mean, they want that belonging, they want to feel valued by their organization and their manager. I think employees are saying, look, we want something different and we want something more meaningful. And I don't see that going away anytime soon. We're having this conversation about jobs that can be done at home or yeah. hybrid. I mean, a nurse, a pilot, a bus driver, they're not going to have any of these options. However, you can still create flexibility for those roles. You can still talk to a bus driver about her connection back to what an organization's purpose is. Those efforts are underway. 
Already, 58% of American workers say they have the option to work from home for at least part of the week. Okay, you want the purple one? AT&T network center technician Val Wilson isn't among them. In April, after she'd been working at home for two years, AT&T ordered her department back to the office five days a week. My heart sunk. It's almost a slap in the face. Due to the reason we've been doing the job, it's been proven for those two years. You've patted us on the back for our productivity. To make matters worse, Wilson says that AT&T consolidated three departments onto a single crowded floor of a new building. We're all on edge, so to say. And then all it takes is for one person to cough or sneeze and that anxiety kicks in again because you're like, where did it come from? So your office morale right now is none. Do you think they'll lose some good talent with that approach? We've already lost good talent. When we were forced back in, we've already lost some. Are they in any danger of losing you if this situation doesn't get better? I'm sorry, I get emotional <laughs> when that comes up because I feel like I've done so much and put in so much to get to 30 years of service. And to make that decision to leave early, it's painful. As a union steward, Wilson has proposed a hybrid plan to her bosses. She's hopeful that they'll allow working at home two days a week. AT&T told us, we have been very clear that employees would not work from home indefinitely. In the meantime, Yelp CEO Jeremy Stoppelman concedes that the great shift to remote work might strike some traditionalists as radical. It's a crazy idea. I, I totally get that. It, it's a huge transition. It's disruptive to the way that, that we thought about the office for 100 plus years. We have a lot of employees that are doing their job simply at a computer every day. You could probably go remote and it's going to be a win for everybody. To me, there are certain employees that would be better <coughs> in doing things remote because of their surrounding circumstances. They got kids, uh, they live in a congested area. <clears throat> it's gonna cost them a lot of money to commute back and forth. And those are the people that the uh, the boss man needs to diversify his, his resources towards. Understanding that the best of the two worlds can be joggled around to the point that for some, it may not be so good, and for others, it will be good. And, of course, it depends upon the career. You know, you can't very well be a daycare uh, daycare watchman or a daycare center, uh, resource uh, center, whatever, if you're not doing things hands-on. So we're reaching that dividing line here in society, here in America especially, to where... Sometimes the two of the best worlds are, in fact, the best of the worlds. Because for some, it may be better to commute, and for others, it may be better to do it online, digitally. So we're growing. We're finally evolving. The world is finally starting to grow up. I'm the same way with other types of cultures and uh, positions. Let's go back to this real quick first, though. Turn the tide. David Martin reports. It's been a standard, largely unnoticed, part of the American military arsenal for decades. But when HIMARS, an acronym which stands for High Mobility Artillery Rocket System, showed up in Ukraine, it changed the face of that. This capability has given the Ukrainians the potential to completely change the momentum and the direction of, the, of this war. Retired Lieutenant General Ben Hodges, former commander of the U.S. Army in Europe, says HIMARS, which fires a 200-pound warhead up to 50 miles and hits within 10 feet of its intended target, has virtually eliminated Russia's numerical advantage. You don't have to have hundreds of artillery rounds to achieve the same effect as one rocket fired from Hamos. Is Ukraine still outgunned? 
in numbers, I'd say yes, but what really matters is effect. And the effect that Ukraine is achieving seems to me at this point to be superior to what the Russians are able to deliver. Since June, the U.S. has shipped Ukraine 16 HIMARS launchers and thousands of rockets, which defense officials say the Ukrainians have used to attack more than 350 Russian command posts, ammo dumps, supply depots, and other high-value targets far back from the front lines. The HIMARS and other long-range capabilities have, have given the Ukrainians the ability to reach out and hit targets that the Russians would have thought were safe. Why can't they just move all these command posts and ammo dumps further back from the front line and get them out of range? You still got to get that ammunition to the guns, which are closer to the front. So now you've increased the distance that the trucks have to move carrying very heavy ammunition. And they've lost well over a thousand of their trucks in this campaign so far. And of course, the result is significant reduction in the amount of Russian artillery and rocket fire impacting on Ukrainian forces. All that from a weapon made at this Lockheed Martin plant in rural Arkansas, a seemingly minor outpost in America's vast military industrial complex, which is now racing to catch up with the sudden demand for HIMARS. We'll give you a brief overview of the chassis line here. We accompanied the Pentagon's chief weapons buyer, Dr. William LaPlante, as he made plans to dramatically increase production. And we have to plan for at least to double this. Production here probably will need to double. How long can you keep that up? As long as the demand is needed. We can keep production lines open for 30 years. So you heard the man from the Pentagon, he said probably going to double production. Can you double production? Absolutely. Chief Operating Officer Frank St. John says the plant is currently turning out about 7,500 rockets a year. That we have capacity to produce 10,000 rockets a year. That's a rocket every 10 minutes, if you do the math on that. And we're also doing similar analysis to potentially take that up to 12 or 14,000 rockets a year. So how fast can you do this? I would say on the order of 18 to 24 months to make any significant changes in, uh, in the production quantities. The nose cone carries a satellite guidance system which gives the rocket its sniper-like accuracy. But what impresses LaPlante most about HIMARS is not the sophistication of its technology, but the simplicity of its use. There are just three operators, probably 18 to 20 years old, and they can use this and they can use it effectively within a week. Okay, that is to me as important as its accuracy, which is reliable and can be done by 18-year-old Ukrainians. To see how HIMARS operates in the field, we went to the U.S. Army training range in Yakima, Washington. They used the same tactics taught to the Ukrainians. This is the hide site where the HIMARS tries to conceal itself from enemy surveillance. Once it leaves here for its firing point, the HIMARS is liable to be detected and targeted. So the clock starts ticking. The HIMARS launcher has a top speed of 55 miles an hour, but off-road in the high desert, it's more like 35. Once it's out in the open, it has about five to seven minutes to find its firing position, train its rockets on the target, and fire. One rocket every few seconds. The crew chief of this HIMARS is Staff Sergeant Cammy White. How'd you guys do? You did well. What does that mean, well? Three minutes from the time you got the mission to the time that the rockets took off. When the HIMARS fires, the rocket exhaust gives away its position. So it has to get out of there fast before the enemy can strike back. How long do you have to get out? Oh, as quickly as possible. And how long does that take? No, roughly a minute. It's called shoot and scoot. And the Ukrainians are doing it now in their counteroffensive against Russian forces occupying Kherson, making the most of the 16 HIMARS provided by the U.S. 16 just doesn't sound like a lot. It's nowhere near what I think uh, Ukraine could use. I mean, look at the effect they've achieved with 16. Imagine if they had three or four times that many.
This portion of Sunday morning is sponsored by Sleep Number. It's time. And the reason why that is that way, which once more, I'm not a war analyst, but I do know watching enough cowboy and western movies and watching enough Civil War movies that um, sometimes, um, sometimes while being out in the field, people either mistakenly or intentionally, one way or the other, shoot off, shoot off a, uh, shoot off a shell, and this can be with a shotgun, a high-powered rifle, or a missile, and the first shot will leave you wondering where that shot is, but if you ever shoot twice, then they can hone in on the direction towards where that shot come from. And the reason why is because you you are now, uh, you have now picked up your advances towards your radar, and now you're actually listening for that second shot to determine where that shot's coming from, because before it caught you unaware. That's why they say that uh, the element of surprise is always in one's in one's uh, favor, kind of like taking a pot shot at somebody towards taking a swing at somebody whenever they're not looking. Gone 25 years. Historian and author Amanda Foreman reflects on the enduring legacy of the people's princess. True national mourning is a rare thing. I saw it 25 years ago after the death of Princess Diana. In fact, I didn't just witness it, I was a part of it. Along with tens of thousands of others, I went to Buckingham Palace to lay flowers in honor of Diana's memory. You couldn't see an inch of sidewalk, it was just flowers everywhere, and people in tears. It's strange to have such strong feelings for someone that you never knew. But to understand why the world erupted in grief then, and why she still has meaning today, you have to realize how revolutionary she was. Diana transformed how we talk about emotions. Until she started being open about her own struggles, which included battling depression and an eating disorder, the whole subject of mental health was completely taboo for most people. She wasn't afraid to discuss her problems and to have someone who was so famous and privileged be willing to talk with such honesty helped millions to do the same. Diana avoided causes that were popular or photogenic to focus on helping some of the most marginalized people in society. At the height of the AIDS epidemic, she challenged the fear and stigma attached to the disease. On the lighter side, Diana loved fashion. By being unapologetically glamorous, she enabled women to show their femininity and still be taken seriously. And despite the sadness surrounding her divorce, she helped the monarchy to modernize itself. Looking back, I think that the tears for Diana came from a sense of real loss. She was the people's princess because she had become a selfless advocate for the least privileged among us. The greatest lesson that we can take from her life is that with courage and honesty, our vulnerabilities and weaknesses can be turned into our greatest strengths. Those are words that are so true because she was a very open person and you don't find that ordinarily in people in those categories um, I'm glad for the young woman that, that got an opportunity to be able to have enough money to get on an airplane ride and go all the way over there to to visit during that time of grief but you know the majority of us even to this day, don't have that, don't have that luxury. <clears throat> That's the whole sole purpose for having TV, internet, satellite, etc. <clears throat> and I'm going to say the reason why that it was such of a worldwide phenomenon is because of that, and the fact that she was a very, very open, charismatic person that showed her emotions and and didn't 
mind hiding uh, who she really was and what she believed in and etc. Now the next uh, segment that you're fixing to show has a great deal to do with myself towards what went on in 1988 in Ronald Reagan's administration whenever nine tapes wound up going to the White House that one day in the hereafter I'm going to have to walk up to this individual and apologize because of the way that my people reacted and responded here in America towards the rejection that the founder of the Windmill Ministries missions received from the so-called church communities here in America. That person that they're fixing to show is the very person that helped in the old Russia USSR that very person was the person that had desires and dreams towards the Russian people becoming more than just an evil empire. That person that I'm talking about is Mr. Gorbachev. That has passed and is no longer with us uh, the way that I understand it, that it's a possibility that it could have been... Uh, a deliberate attempt towards somebody doing something illegitimately to his life that the Russian government is very very famous for that's the reason why I call President Putin today poisonous Putin because of the track record that has followed him on the Supreme Court for nearly five decades breaking some of the biggest stories of the era Nina Totenberg is in conversation with correspondent Nancy Corda. We're going to go forward beyond that. I thought it, the next segment was going to be Gorbachev. I'm sorry about that. Um, this is a very, very uh, unusual person too as well. Her father, the great concert violinist Roman Totenberg, thought differently. Because he played with women musicians, he never suggested to me, oh, you can't do that because you're a woman. She found she was the only woman in most newsrooms until she arrived at NPR in 1975. Women were everywhere at NPR doing all kinds of things and in, even in administrative positions because we paid so little, no man would take the job. She became fast friends with All Things Considered co-host Susan Stamberg and reporters Linda Wertheimer and Cokie Roberts. Today, they're known as NPR's founding mothers. But back then, their cluster of cubicles was dubbed the fallopian jungle. I took it with a grain of salt at a kind of a compliment because the jungle, you wouldn't dare go in there, right? Right? <laughs> I'd be afraid. Yeah, so that's fine. Don't screw with me. One of her biggest scoops came in 1991 when she uncovered something explosive during confirmation hearings for Supreme Court nominee Clarence Thomas. I found out that there was a woman named Anita Hill who had accused then Judge Thomas of sexual harassment when she worked for him. Anita Hill agreed to speak to her. The relationship, she said, became even more strained when Thomas, in work situations, began to discuss sex. So help you guys. I do. And then Hill spoke to Congress. He talked about pornographic material. Republicans were furious and took aim at Totenberg. You've been beating the drum on this one almost every day since it started. I do not appreciate being blamed just because I do my job and report the news. Listeners got to know her voice and her face, which ended up plastered all over the ultimate NPR status symbol. Can we talk about the Nina Totenberg tote bag? The tote bag? I was initially very suspicious about it, but I, I love this. It makes me look great. Nina also had a knack for befriending Supreme Court justices long before they were named to the court. I first knew Scalia when he was in the Nixon administration, and the same was true for Chief Justice Rehnquist. Her most famous friendship with the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg began 21 years before Ginsburg was nominated, when she was still a law professor at Rutgers University. I was reading a brief of hers 
there's a whole bunch in the brief that I didn't understand. Her telephone number was there, and I caught her up, and I got an hour-long lecture. That led to more calls and dinners, where they talked about music and theater and fashion. They gossiped, and they leaned on each other as they both cared for dying husbands. Ruth was married to Marty Ginsburg for 56 years, Nina to Senator Floyd Haskell for 19 years. She knew you weren't looking at her as a source. She knew you were looking at her as a friend. If you have a Supreme Court justice friend, you don't ask about their work. Otherwise, they won't be your friend. After Haskell's death, Nina met a widower, Dr. David Rines, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg married them in 2000. I wasn't too worried about it, so we told my mother. And I said, not a rabbi, we got a judge. She said, a judge? I said, but she's Jewish. I don't care. It's Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I don't care. She's not a rabbi. Rhines could cook, which meant even more dinners with RBG, who always requested the bouillabaisse. She would eat chicken, but her favorite was seafood. And in her last years of life, that last year, we cooked for her 23 consecutive Saturdays. Nina's book is titled Dinners with Ruth. In it, she describes how Ruth and Dr. Rines would sneak away to discuss Ruth's medical challenges, including lung cancer, leaving Nina in the dark. And I couldn't say anything. So for six weeks, I lied to her, basically. <laughs> Why did you feel like you had to lie? A, it was a HIPAA violation. And B, I didn't want any, any leak. Do you have any regrets? I, I do think that I was born on, under a very bright star. Nina interviewed RBG in public dozens of times. Their last private conversation was by phone a few days before Ruth died two years ago this month. I said to her, you are my darling friend, and I'm just, it's been one of the great parts of my life that you've been my friend. It turns out that the hard-hitting Nina Totenberg may not be as tough as she would have her sources believe. I think I learned a lot from my friends to be a more generous person, how to be a better friend. I think they taught me to be a better person. Well, no one can answer that question but you. Like I said, I thought that it was going to be the Gorbachev story. Um, sorry about that. I haven't, obviously, I haven't uh, watched this show and pre-selected towards what was going to come on. I just seen the previews, what was going to be happening, and I just, well, I was, that was the wrong call for me. I love these shows because a lot of them bring out the human factor of the celebrities that we are familiar with towards their ins and outs or ups and downs. True at heart. Which is ordinarily the side that you don't hear from just your local media. Filmmaker Ken Burns has said of his latest documentary, he doesn't expect to work on a more important film. With Susan Spencer, we take a closer look. This wing of the family all died in the Holocaust. All of them. All of them. We're that here. dark chapter in history left an indelible mark on filmmaker Sarah Botstein's family. They died in the ghetto of typhus. They were killed in a killing center. They died in all the different ways that the Jews in that part of the world died. So it was a deeply personal experience for Botstein to work on a documentary about the Holocaust with Ken Burns. So much has been written about the Second World War, about the Holocaust. Why did you even want to take another look? Seeing it through the lens of the United States helps us, I believe, understand the Holocaust itself in a, in a much different and perhaps fresher perspective. We tell ourselves stories as a nation. 
one of the stories we tell ourselves is that we're a land of immigrants. But in moments of crisis, it becomes very hard for us to live up to those stories. Their film, seven years in the making and airing on PBS later this month, is entitled The U.S. and the Holocaust. In painstaking detail, Burns, Botstein, and their partner Lynn Novick unravel how America reacted to this humanitarian catastrophe. We failed. You know, we let in more human beings than any other sovereign nation. But if we'd done 10 times that many, I think we would have failed. And it's a failure at every level. It's a failure in the executive. It's a failure in the legislative branch. It's a failure in media. It's a failure in um, the general population. Many white Protestant Americans came to fear they were about to be outnumbered and outbred by the newcomers and their offspring that they were being replaced. The documentary cites shocking national polls to make the point. In 1938, just two weeks after Kristallnacht, a night of terror when Nazis attacked and murdered Jews across Germany, only one in five Americans said the U.S. should admit more Jewish exiles. The following year, that number was one in 10. Was this because of a lack of information? We cannot blame America's lack of action on not knowing. There was a great deal of coverage in the newspapers of what Hitler was doing as the situation got worse and worse and worse. Deportations, mass killings, thousands of refugees trying to get out, lines at consulates. All of this was known. But instead of opening our doors, we shut them ever more tightly, says Lynn Novick, who partly blames widespread American xenophobia. Celebrity aviator Charles Lindbergh was the face of it. He was an icon. As I listened to that while ago, it reminded me of the very thought of what's going on right now here in America towards people thinking that the true Red-blooded Americans are going to be replaced because of our immigrant policies, because of so many people coming over here to the United States. Um, why people feel that way, I can see both perspectives from it, but that's one of the things that has made America great, is the fact that we was diversified and that we was willing to take on so many different foreigners. Um, I've never been against people wanting to come over here legally and set up their lives and start all over again to a better way of life, <clears throat> but it's those that are that are uh, illegitimately coming over here illegally are the ones that I've always been opposed to uh, because those are the people ordinarily that if they're going to be willing to do that, ain't no telling us what else that they've already done, achieved, and accomplished in their lives towards being rootless cruel, mean, evil people that God only knows what that they have been a part of because over in their sector of life, uh, there's no way of keeping keeping uh, a history chart in what they have done because their system is built differently than ours. In other words, uh, they could have murdered somebody and actually been punished for it but it never was recorded in their system and now since they've come over here uh, we still don't know if they're murderers or rapists or whatever <clears throat> it's really uh, <clears throat> it's really sad <clears throat> how that our government has let us down in that perspective here in America oh they had songs about him and he really believed a kind of ugly <coughs> anti-Semitic, white supremacist ideology. That and that, that anti-Semitic, Semit, Semitic, uh, anti, uh, basically, movement that began then is still alive and well to this day, even probably more so in America, towards anti-Semitic, because uh, the true Christians here in America, those that are conformed in in the uh, in that particular united movement have always been made fun of holy rollers bible thumpers etc etc 
has always been made fun of ever since that I was big enough to understand and realize the culture of America. But it's been just within the past 10 years to where we have seen this anti, uh, anti-Semitic movement that, that has brought violence and hostility to so many people's lives. Not just my own here at 291 Thompson Road, Sharon, Tennessee, zip code 38255, that obviously the uh, judicial justice system uh, here in Weekly County uh, could have cared less about. But uh, this now is going on uh, nationwide, and it's not just against the Jews. Uh, it's, it, you know, the people where the gunmen went into the church while they was praying in South Carolina, they wasn't Jews. They was just regular worshipers, black worshiper, uh, a family that the killer went in and, and killed all them people. So we're seeing this movement now, this ugly monster stick out its ugly head again over here in America. And if we do not put an end to it or stop it or at least put up a resistance against it, it's only going to grow intensely worse and worse and worse. And I think that that's one of the reasons why that President Biden uh, made his speech a few nights ago was because you can, you can feel and see this, not just on the computer, but in everyday life, in, in everyday living here in America, towards how many people are anti-Semitic, they're against people, that don't walk like them, talk like them, dress like them, eat like them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's one of the characteristics that made America so strong is that we was diversified and we would allow for Jews and Gentiles and, and, and Amish and, and Mennonites and, and Jehovah Witness and, and the Lutherans and the Seventh-day Adventist and, and, uh, the Mormons and et cetera, to come over here and do whatever that they wanted to do, in addition to the Buddhist and, and all the other different types of religion throughout all the other world. You know, the Bible says to let the wheat grow with the tares until time of harvest. We're not yet at that harvest time, even though they was really and really wanting me to be harvested by them. The harvesters was coming out. At 291 Thompson Road, Sharon, Tennessee, zip code 38255, or at 430 Beach Grove Road, Sharon, Tennessee, 3255, towards hoping that they would either drive us off into a state of basically uh, criminal activity, or they themselves would cause us to either commit suicide, or to turn on one another, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And to think that the judicial system here in Weekly County set back and allowed for that to happen for three years is an absolutely shame. It's it's a shameful disgrace. You know, I've said this before, and I'll say it again at, at the, uh, at the uh, retirement of Mike Wilson that has, been, that has been elected for nine different terms here in Weekly County. No matter what official that it may be, a judge a sheriff, or whoever, um, by and large, that particular person, that particular pos the depression. position of that person is only as good as the people that put him or her in there. And, of course, whenever you have a society that has been working under the table illegally towards basically a, uh, a syndicate society that makes more money doing things illegally than they do legally, well, then you have a government or a country that is being steadily deteriorated by the very people that helped to form that that uh, that government that is now that is now creating a syndicate type movement that is supposed to be against all the rules and regulations of a decent society. That for each country. During the war, a State Department official named Breckenridge Long enforced those restrictions with gusto. He also assiduously worked to sort of suppress information about the true nature of the Nazi threat to the Jewish people of Europe. So reports came across his desk that he should have passed on to other people that he just buried. Reports such as extermination is a policy. Yes, exactly. 
We made it hard technically to get here. Paperwork, visas, affidavits, sponsors. I mean, you can appreciate now how hard it is just to renew your passport. Mm -hmm. And you're now stateless. You're in a country that's been taken over. We made it very onerous and hard to get here. So all of this, or most of this, is just paperwork. Mm -hmm. And you just imagine for anyone who came here, all of this had to happen. In Lynn Novick's office, case files tell the story of World War II refugees desperate to get to America. Among them, a household name. When we started to make the film, it came to our attention that Anne Frank's family had tried to get to America, a fact that I did not know. And I don't think most people know that. I don't think most Americans know that. We all know Anne Frank. Everybody knows Anne Frank. And to think that she could be here talking to you right now if America had had a different immigration policy. I that, believe that. that. I absolutely believe that. I absolutely believe that. By 1945, two out of every three European Jews had been murdered. Yet even then, only 5% of Americans wanted to let more refugees in, while more than a third said we should admit even fewer. That's after you've seen the horrific images of the liberation of the camps and the bodies piled up and the emaciated people. That is a tough pill to swallow very tough pill to swallow. You know? Are you worried that people will interpret this as sort of a indicting our nation, if you will? I, I don't see this at all as an indictment. I really don't. I think we're really, truly trying to just <coughs> tell the story of what happened. It's not shaming America. It's thinking about how to do better. Hundreds of white nationalists storming the University of Virginia. At the very end, there's this montage with no narration. Charlottesville, a build a wall rally, a report of attack on a synagogue. What did you intend to convey with that montage? There is right now all of the elements coalescing for something bad to happen again. You felt a sense of urgency I, I growing. Feel, I feel a sense of urgency. We're not trying to equate anything with the Holocaust. That would be a, a, a horrible, a horrible thing to do. We're just saying, let's not get there again as, a, as, as human beings, please. Let's not get there again. And I truly believe that that was one of the, one of the things that motivated uh, Biden, our president, because he realized that we was stepping tonight on... we was stepping on the boundaries of that very reappearance or reoccurrence towards it happening here in America versus over there and that's <coughs> that's not an ideal uh, situation or position that any country or any group really wants to be in and that's exactly where they put me whenever I come back here in 2014 because they had talked so much they had ridiculed me they had demonized me they had dehumanized me they had plotted all these different things about me because they already knew that they had failed in not understanding or supporting the windmill ministries missions and because of it this was this was society's way of responding and reacting whenever I come back here in 20 and 14 here in Northwest Tennessee. I mean, it's very obvious towards what has occurred. Uh, rather not anybody wants to agree with that or not, um, you know, they, they can they can walk around in denial all they want, but the fact of the matter is, uh, America has always been on the threshold of either going one way or the other to the extremes. And this is what you just got to witness in, is another one of those extremes pertaining to immigration policies and laws that was entirely too strict back then to the point that now they're not strict enough. We have always, for some reason, gone from the far right to the far left. Unbelievable. Unbelievable how that a society can, can change that quickly to the point that now what they're doing to themselves is bringing that much more danger and hostility to their own personal lives. Planet, Hillary and Chelsea Clinton. And this morning they're talking over a little lunch with Nora O'Donnell.
How would you describe a gutsy woman? I think a gutsy woman is determined to make the most of her own life, but also to try to use whatever skills, talents, persistence that she has uh, to bring others along. Well, and you can do it in any field or in any area. And so whether that's sports or activism mm -hmm. or the arts, mm -hmm. it was really important to us that there be a wide spectrum of women who have been hugely gutsy for themselves and for right. their communities. We're hitting the road to shine a light on women who inspire us to be bolder and braver. Hillary Clinton has a new campaign, along with her daughter Chelsea, telling the stories of gutsy women in a new docu-series on Apple TV+. Plus. You literally become one with yourself. Do you think people like gutsy women? I think some people like gutsy women. I think some people are afraid and threatened, threatened by gutsy women. I think some are put off by gutsy women. Women like comedian Amy Schumer, whom they met for tea. I did go through 10 years of being like majorly trolled. You won't be able to relate to this. No, not majorly at all. Majorly trolled. We want this other version of women. We want you to be pretty and quiet and effusive and, and, and open a supporting cast member. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, just the series shows the former first lady and first daughter, who was mostly shielded from public view, in a new light. I'm not of the generation that grew up with rappers, male or female, and Chelsea has for years been trying to educate both Bill and me. Back whenever I was growing up in this particular community around here, their memento was keep the women uh, barefooted during the, w during the winter, that way they wouldn't run off and pregnant during the summer. They were still trying to hold on to that stance towards controlling women like a bunch of slaves. You keep in mind that America once more went from one perspective to another in which I'm glad that women now has that opportunity to be able to grow and prosper and become successful in their careers because I can remember a time whenever my mother did not have those opportunities. A matter of fact, the women before my mother sure enough did not have those opportunities and if you go back to the early 1900s, they wasn't even eligible to vote. They was looked down upon towards being basically unhuman or not qualified to be able to make those type of decisions uh, similar towards how that they desegregated the black man or the Indian man. So this European movement that started over here basically in the 14, 15 hundreds is still something that we're having to deal with today in regards towards people not willing to give other people a true opportunity or a chance to show themselves towards who they are and what they are. And that's all I've ever expected out of anybody was a little bit of honesty, truthfulness, and fair play. And, of course, I see real quick whenever I come back to Weekly County, I didn't get that now, did I? A bag filled with probably red food coloring. But they said, you know, this is the blood of an American. And even what makes it even more sadder is that my brother David Jeffrey Jackson got caught up in the middle of all that, and he sure enough didn't get treated fairly and and, uh, and 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 in a right perspective towards how that they was not only attacking me, but attacking him too as well. You also reveal why you wear a pantsuit. Yes. Yes. You know, I didn't know that story. <laughs> I, mean, I didn't know that story. It's like by far and away the greatest revelation I had. <laughs> a state visit to Brazil led to some compromising photographs. I was sitting on a couch, and the press was let in. There were a bunch of them shooting up. Some of those photos were then used to sell lingerie. And all of a sudden, the White House gets alerted to these billboards that show me sitting down with, I thought my legs together, but the way it's shot, it's sort of suggestive. And then I also began to have the experience of having photographers all the time. I'd be on a stage, I'd be climbing stairs, and so they'd be creepy. below me. So creepy. Do you think there is an effort underway to silence women and to intimidate them? Yes, I do. While pantsuits may be synonymous with Hillary Clinton, it is another decision she's well known for that she considers gutsy. The gutsiest thing I ever did privately was stay in my marriage. It was not easy, and it was something that only I could decide. 
And then in my public life, running for president. I mean, it was hard. It was really hard. And it was, you know, trying to be on that tightrope without a net and nobody in front of me because it hadn't been done before. I guess I was surprised that you said that staying in your marriage was gutsier than running for president. Well, it was, in terms of my private life, um, it was really hard. And as you know, everybody had an opinion about it. Uh, people who I'd never met had very strong opinions about it. Um, and it took a lot of, honestly, prayer and thoughtfulness and talking to people I totally trusted uh, to... I can truly understand how that there was a stigma built around that particular event that happened in her life with her husband towards how that people is judgmental and how that people wants to condemn people over the very same things that they themselves has been a part of or had done to them that they're that uh, the public in general is cruel and whenever it comes to them being compassionate in matters like this I can see where she went through something because of the way that the people are Women's examples can be inspiring to anyone who might be watching. Mm -hmm. um, men and boys. Men and boys. Yeah. Um, but I think also so that people hopefully can see part of their own life, whether their own struggles, their own opportunities in the women's stories that we're sharing so that they hopefully can then be a little bit closer to feeling, well, I can be gutsy too. Mm -hmm. And it's really a shame that over here in America pertaining to our, our, um, our fortitude towards how that we have grown and prosperous as a young nation towards being uh, courageous and etc. cetera. Uh, it, it's really a shame that so many people has to fight and some people fight and fight and fight until there is no more fight left in them and I guess that's where they wanted to put me at uh, to the point that either I broke the law or I done something to myself once more trying to drive me off into a state of suicide or or basically criminal activity to the point that I done something uh, to the point of shooting myself in the foot that I would regret the rest of my life that's where society around here wanted to put me at and in doing so they basically caused an early death to my brother at the age of 51 years old, which is extremely cruel and it's extremely um, evil to think. I mean, even my brother told me more than once, Juby, if we was living back in the times whenever my grandfather, right, my great-grandfather right down the road was uh, holding court, working for Obion County, the state of Tennessee, and going around hanging people as being a dutyator uh, before the counties ever got established as good as they are today. This would have been before World War One. And uh, my brother David said, Jibby, if we was living back in that era, they would have just come out here and just hung us. Especially you. But they would have probably hung me too, David said, because I'm... I'm associated with you towards me and your brother and at that point in time I realized that David was feeling the pressures that was coming down the pike because of the way that the community felt about me and they was putting those type of pressures upon him because he was my brother I couldn't tell you the amount of times that that uh, I was frightened for his very life of not knowing if he was going to wind up being bushwhacked uh, some sort of a some sort of a deal towards people capturing him or catching him on the bottom down here coming home at two o'clock at night knowing people knowing his uh, work uh, program pertaining to him working on second shift I couldn't tell you the amount of times that I called David and said David you may want to get your gun out they're back at it again they're out here raising teetotal hell and uh, uh, be, uh, be on the watch out and you know whenever a person has to live in that type of anxiety from day to day to day from night to night to night uh, it has it has a psychological effect on them and of course your psychological uh, emotions can have a big uh, factor on your physical life your emotional life can actually 
draw you or bring you down to the point that it will basically make you sick. And I feel like that that's what occurred to David. And within those three year, uh, within that three year uh, terminal, within that three year time, <clears throat> that's whenever uh, that's whenever uh, the community uh, put so many pressures upon my brother, he just couldn't stand it. This is an error here pertaining to the 60s and the 70s that to this day they still brag about and feel good about themselves. Suggested by Winner's mentor, Ralph Gleason, hipster music critic of the San Francisco Chronicle. He was kind of a, you know, conscious. <clears throat> he was a moral conscious. Gleason also had the idea for Rolling Stone's first big scoop. He'd heard that John Lennon and Yoko Ono were releasing a new album, Two Virgins but their label had rejected a cover photo of the couple fully naked. So Ralph said, why don't you write to them and suggest that we have publish it? Okay, so I wrote them a letter and then within two weeks, a mailing tube comes back from England and it's got the two versions pictures in it and it's dynamite. I love that they just arrive in a mailing tube. <laughs> it's what I call the family jewels arrived. <laughs> Did you hesitate at all about publishing it? No, not for a second. Rolling Stone ran it as a center spread. That was our first anniversary issue and the first time we ever got any kind of press or coverage or notice was publishing those pictures. Suddenly, the magazine was on the cultural map. Mick Jagger reached out. He said we should publish Rolling Stone together in England. I said, of course, you know, why not? You know, what, I'll do, what do you want to do? I'll do it, you know, and... <laughs> it didn't work out too well. It, it lasted about a half a year. Mick had one idea for it, what it should be like. I had another idea for it. Winner quickly shut it down. He was a gentleman about it, you said. He was a total gentleman about it. But their friendship would be challenged in 1969 when a fan was stabbed to death during the Rolling Stones' closing set at the Altamont Festival. You gave 17 pages to Altamont cover yes. it. Yeah. It was a huge story. It was right in our backyard. The magazine called it Rock and Roll's all-time worst day. There are many people to blame for that, mm -hmm. and the Stones certainly were one of them. You call it a defining moment for the magazine. Were you going to back your friends, or were you going to tell the truth? Right, and you have to tell the truth. Jagger sent Wenner a telegram. We no longer trust you to quote us fully or in context, he wrote. I hope our friendship can flourish again one day. It wasn't the only critical mail Winner would receive. Outraged by a nasty review, Roger Taylor of Queen slammed the outdated, opinionated, down-home rag. He sent us a letter to the editor, really angry, but he wrote it out on a barf bag from an airplane. <laughs> I love that touch. <laughs> you gotta love that. He's a man of style. <laughs> yes. On the cover of the Rolling Stone. As Rolling Stone grew, Winner put together a roster of irreverent writers, including Tom Wolfe and Hunter S. Thompson. With Rolling Stone, I was, I was given the, the room and the range to uh, really get down. Winner remembers the day the godfather of gonzo journalism first walked into his office with a satchel. And then the satchel he starts pulling cards of cigarettes and tar guard lighters and flashlight batteries and road flares, you know, he pulls road, road flares. flares. And then he finally pulls out this this kind of siren thing, you know, sticks on my desk, he turns on, ah, and everything. So that, that's my introduction to Hunter. And then he talked for two hours. The Hunter was really the great mad genius of Rolling Stone and became kind of the soul of Rolling Stone for a long time. <laughs> For the first 27 years that he ran the magazine, the married winner kept a secret, that he was gay. I'm curious because rock and roll was not particularly open to homosexuality. No, not at all. Did that worry you? I'm not really. How did you deal with it? You just shut up. You keep it quiet. You keep it to yourself, you know? Mm -hmm. You pretend you're not. And you, you can learn to get adjusted to that, I think, that way of life. Yeah. Then, in 1994, he met fashion designer Matt Nye and split with his wife, Jane. But telling her couldn't have been easy. It never is. Not that, divorce, anything like that. But it all worked out. My wife now lives down the road here, not 10 minutes away. And they do combined families. My husband now, Matt, and my wife then, Jane, they're easier about it than I am. <laughs> You're caught in the middle. Yeah, well, they have something mutual to come. You see what I'm saying about them being bold and, and, 
and uh, basically not ashamed. Uh, they're the very people that helped to put us where we are today, and yet now they still brag about their about their maverick a maverick type movement that began back in the late fifties, early sixties, pertaining to the baby boomers. Three back operations infected in there. I had four eye operations. It, it was <laughs> more than enough. What were you thinking in the middle of all that? Uh, you learn about, a lot about yourself when you when you face that kind of experience. That what kind you of learn? How precious life is. How lucky you are to still be alive. How important it is to have friends and family. Of course it says, when it, Winter and I last met in 2017, his son Gus had taken over day-to-day -day editing of the magazine, which they had put up for sale. A few months later, Penske Media bought Rolling Stone. Gus was asked to stay. His father was not. It was time to get out for me. You know, I had seen the glory days. We put out one of the best magazines of our times, arguably. But from the way you describe it, it wasn't easy letting go. Yeah, it was difficult at first, the transition of, well, I thought I'd still be in charge, you know, or at least I'd have, they would come to me for what to do. They yeah. would ask my opinion about things. And the only difficult part was establishing, realizing that they weren't. And that more than anybody, the person who didn't really want to come to me all the time was my son. You know, he was tired of being told what to do. It's just that, that extra little distance was just... One of the things you said to me when we talked in 2017 was, why would anybody want Rolling Stone without me? <laughs> Here, well, now we know. <laughs> Is it as good without me? Of course not. <laughs> but it's very good, and I had the best of times. No remorse, no guilt, no shame. <clears throat> and, of course, somebody like me that comes, comes into the play... Um, talking about how that my glory days were stolen because of those that was against me or, or those that didn't want to support me. Uh, I'm looked upon now as being a troublemaker or a bad news barrier because I tell the truth about what has occurred in my particular life going back into 1983 on up to where we are now, soon to be in 2023, uh, of the adjustment periods that I had to go through and all the persevering that I had to go through because of so many people that was stereotypes that wanted to classify me as me either being uh, crazy or out of out of touch with reality. I think is how that the local media in, in uh, Oklahoma uh, phrased it. Uh, they wanted to uh, turn it around after 9/11 up here in Martin, Tennessee, towards trying to put me in the category of me being a homegrown terrorist or having the potential as a homegrown terrorist. And I can see where that uh, that basically snowballed to the events that happened to me in 2007, 2009, and then in 2012. Upper and Western Kentucky, in addition towards what happened to me, whenever I went and stayed three days uh, at the at the Davidian compound there in Mount Karma outside of Waco, Texas, and then I went up into the Oklahoma City Range and I investigated the Oklahoma bombing and found out the truth towards a government cover-up and tried to expose that too. So I can see where uh, the movement, the resistance movement started out in one fashion towards your anti-Semitism and then it growed to the point that they wanted to actually make me into a monster and the very people that was the monsters was the very people that was trying to project me as me being the monster. Same type of scenario happened with Jesus Christ. They wanted to declare Jesus Christ as him being a monster. Here we go here. Please listen. Yesterday, lifted the Iron Curtain, ended the Cold War, and transformed global politics. While the current leader of Russia, Vladimir Putin, laid flowers on Gorbachev's casket Thursday, Putin did not attend the funeral. The Kremlin says he was too busy. Ted Koppel takes us back to a moment in time when he witnessed Gorbachev's final hours as president of the Soviet Union. Christmas Day, 1991. 
Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev arrives at the Kremlin for what will mark the end of the Soviet Union and his last day as president. Back then, I was still at ABC. For reasons of his own, Gorbachev has granted an ABC News production team and me exclusive access. We joined him in his Kremlin office. There's an innocuous looking briefcase holding, we are told, the nuclear launch codes. His successor, Boris Yeltsin, will have one of his people pick it up shortly. The American president, George H.W. Bush, is celebrating the Christmas holiday at Camp David. Gorbachev calls to say goodbye. Hello. Да, Джордж, дорогой, приветствую. Джордж, мой дорогой, поздравить вас с Рождеством и Барбару. Let me begin from the by saying something pleasant. I would like to say Merry Christmas to, to you and to Barbara and to your entire family. It's how the final hours go. A series of goodbyes culminating with a farewell broadcast to the Russian people. Дорогие соотечественники. Dear fellow citizens. An hour after the resignation speech, I'm invited back into the office. Sir, I understand we're saying goodbye. But I'm not saying farewell. <laughs> I, I hope not. Gorbachev's answer to an innocuous question resonates strangely now, more than 30 years later, here in the United States. What are you going to do tomorrow? Tomorrow I will still be here sorting out some papers and uh, some personal effects. Some will be sending uh, will be sent to archives, some will be destroyed, some uh, will be back to my country home and city apartment. So I have to do it, it's the big wash. And a haunting answer to an earlier question. Was there a Russian fable that might explain to an American child why Gorbachev, so popular in our country, was being forced out of office in his? Centuries ago, there was a young ruler in the Orient, and he wanted to rule in a different way, in a more human way, in his kingdom. And he asked uh, the views of the wise men. And it took uh, 10 years to bring uh, 20 carts with volumes of advice. He said, when am I going to read all that? I have to govern my country. Uh, 10 years later, they brought him just 10 volumes of advice. He said, that too is too much. Five years later, he was brought just one volume, small volume. But unfortunately, 25 years had passed and he was on his deathbed. And when the wise man looked at the book, he didn't even give the book to that dying man. He said, well, all in all, all that is here can be summarized in a simple formula. People are born, people suffer, and people die. People are born, people suffer, and people die. Mikhail Gorbachev would live another 30 years, widely admired throughout much of the world, for bringing an end to a communist Soviet Union. But Gorbachev was mostly ignored and sometimes even reviled at home for the very things that made him so popular in the West. And to this day, now we see the repercussions of those various old oligarchs that refused to conform, that government refused to conform, that now has stuck its ugly head out in identifying itself as being that in which what Ronald Reagan accused it of being back uh, during the time that, that Ronald Reagan uh, told Gorbachev to tear down that wall that it was an evil empire. And now those very words are resonating in coming true in now the world seeing 
just exactly what Ronald Reagan was talking about in the old as well as the present government still to this day being that evil empire. And now the grief has fallen upon to millions of people's lives, um, not just the Ukrainians and the surrounding countries around the Ukrainians, but, but also with the, uh, with the uh, imbalances that's happened with the grain, the imbalances that's happened with the prices, the imbalances that's happened with, uh, with the fuel cost, the imbalances that's happened with, with the price of the fertilizer that, that a great deal of people had to be out more money this year just to be able to uh, produce and put in a crop. Now we're seeing the tail end of that in which what Ronald Reagan was talking about as far as them being a evil empire. And until the people themselves are willing to stand up against this type of heathenistic barbaricness, uh, Russia is going to continue to be looked upon as being a evil, their government is going to continue to be looked upon as being an evil empire, and they're going to basically be... Um, ostracized or are treated a, as a uh, a dinosaur per se because of them being piranhas uh, that that now the consequences will fall upon to their whole their whole countrymen as, as far as their people their citizens in their country that will suffer because of it it's really sad and, and I put a great deal of that blame upon to what didn't happen that should have happened after Ronald Reagan got off of the airplane that talked about peace, but in reality went just in the opposite direction, pertaining to Desert Storm and Desert Shield. And, of course, we can see where that blowed up in the American people's face towards Saddam Hussein never having no bombs of mass destruction. And, of course, I believe that what went on then is what prompted 9-11 that brought that much more anguish and sorrow and grief into the American people's lives because basically uh, it was the it was the American government that uh, provoked a group of people in masterminding 9-11 to begin with. And of course it wasn't just our United States military that paid for that, but it was we the people that paid for that. It's really, really a sad, sad state of affairs in what can happen that should have happened but didn't happen. They wanted to promote peace out of one side of their mouths in, in, in telling the superpowers that, that, that this country is a very peaceful, loving, uh, you know, kind, generous uh, country, in which in ways it, it was. In ways it was, but as far as us being a civilized society, don't you feel like that the churches missed a beat? And because they missed a beat and not con willing to conform, similar towards how that the the Russian government wasn't willing to conform after Gorbachev got through doing what he done, uh, they're now suffering the consequences and so are we. We're suffering the consequences towards now all our jobs has been snatched and taken away from us. We're suffering the consequences of recently seeing uh, the Afghanistan war basically blow up in our faces, uh, spending $2 trillion on, and basically the very people that we was at war with take over the, the very country 11 days uh, plus later. Um, it, it's just catastrophe after catastrophe after catastrophe that has went on worldwide simply because of the core of origin that began right here at 291 Thompson Road, Sharon, Tennessee, zip code 38255, whenever I was fasting and praying and retranslating my writings from paper material over to cassette material because of my bad spelling that the Lord himself was directing me to do. It's really, really a, a sad state of affairs towards what the hypocrites, the lukewarm Christians, or the so-called churches has brought into the existence now of not millions, but billions of people's lives all over the world. And to this day, to this day, they're still not wanting to be held accountable for what has occurred. 
they're, they're, they still feel more at ease towards pointing their finger at various people and saying, no, it's their fault. No, it's their fault. Oh, it's this one's fault. Oh, it's that one's fault. Rather than take the initiative of standing up and saying, you know what, it's all of our faults. Well, I can honestly say that I put forth that better foot and I tried to insert the message that God gave me to insert out to the people, even though I was demonized and dehumanized, made fun of and lied upon towards doing so, I tried to help not only the American citizens, but the world, and was rejected for 30 plus some odd years. And as far as I can tell, even to this day in the year 2022, since since uh, the events happened in 1988, which would put it uh, 30 some odd years ago, to this day, I'm still not recognized as being an authentic message, being the messenger of the message. To this day, I'm still being denied or rejected by the American people. And, and it's really sad towards how, how much of a stronghold that these, these evil, corrupt people has, has put up onto society, and of course, by them voting the same the same uh, sheriff in office nine different times, speaks volumes about the type of people that's willing to do this and try to cover up their uh, their inadequacies. Because if 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 Mike Wilson would have been half the sheriff, and I'm going to use this individual as an example, which I know is probably a bad example, but if Mike Wilson would have been half the sheriff that Buford Pulser was down in Adamsville, uh, Tennessee, pretty close to Savannah, by Crump, uh, Tennessee, pretty close to, uh, down in the uh, southwest part of Tennessee, towards coming into this county and cleaning up and getting the drugs off the street and trying to uh, get the crime off the streets, I would look up to the man. Because most any other good sheriff, let's say if you're running for sheriff down in Shelby County, and you're really going to go in there and clean the place up, most of them hardly ever get elected more than twice. Because you're doing such of a good job and you're pissing so many people off that is involved with that illegal trade that they're, they're, uh, they're, they're, they're dead set towards wanting to get you out. That way they can get somebody else in there that they can pot bay, uh, buy off, pay off, uh, basically become a bunch of clonies that own you. And that's basically what Mike Wilson is a part of. And Mike Wilson will have to stand and give an account for that one day because whenever it comes to this this uh, this area of Tennessee, whenever I come back here in 2014, it was actually worse than what it was whenever I left in the early, in the, uh, early 90s whenever I left and started my life five years in Milan, Tennessee, 10 years in Jackson, Tennessee, three years in Henderson, Tennessee, and then about seven or eight years out here on the road going from, from state to state, uh, basically being a storm chaser following the catastrophes and then coming back home. It was worse whenever I come back home in 2014 than what it was whenever I first got married in 1990, 1991 right here in Weekly County, Tennessee. But yet now they want to beat their chest like a bunch of apes and still brag upon one another towards, oh, he's the longest lasting elected sheriff in the state of Tennessee. Well, you know, if the countryside would have been flipped upside down to the point that now we was where we was supposed to be as far as a, a godly, uh, clean, sober nation, you know, I may be willing to walk up and pet. Uh, uh, Mike Wilson on the back or Tommy Moore or Tommy Thomas or some of those other officials that didn't do their jobs for the past 30 plus years that now people are still wanting to pat them on the back and, and tell them what kind of a good, good person that they are. No, we know what kind of person that you are. You're the type of person that can be bought off. You're the type of person that gave in to the corruptfulness pertaining to the citizens that basically become your clonies we know what type of people that you are. You don't have to explain to us and lie to us towards who you are. Because like I said, if you was a good sheriff, half again as good as what Buford Pusser was, I guarantee you, you wouldn't have been elected nine different times by the same group of people again and again 
and again towards going further backwards instead of forwards. It speaks volumes about the so-called churches. It speaks volumes about the citizens in Weekly County, 33 plus thousand or 32 plus thousand people. It speaks volumes about Northwest Tennessee in general towards this type of ideology. It's, it's, it goes beyond sad. It's a travesty. It's a travesty that Mike Wilson, Tommy Moore, Tommy Thomas, uh, all the other uh, local law enforcement agencies around here pertaining to these towns are going to have to give an account for one day. They won't have to worry about me. Don't worry about me. I'm just like you. i got to give an account for my own wrongdoings as well. But the wrongdoings is beginning in Kenton, Tennessee in 1983 that those people are going to have to give an account for to this day that as far as I'm concerned, still has not made amends. I know they hadn't made amends with me, but as far as I'm concerned, they still ain't made amends with the community towards what that they was a part of, towards wanting to scar and, and cripple and basically assassinate a person's character beginning in 1983. To this day, they will give an account for what that they either done that they shouldn't have done or what they didn't do that they should have done in this particular area. Now I'm looking at the bottom of the screen pretending to flash flood warnings. It's just remarkable because uh, for the past two days I was up in in uh, Paris, Tennessee. I went down towards Waverly and I stayed um, stayed the uh, night before last over in the Waverly, Tennessee area of the town that got crippled by a large uh, rainstorm that hit that last year that they claim like something like 20 20 people died 20 plus people died and basically tore up their town tremendously pertaining to the floodwaters um i went to a restaurant yesterday and in doing so one of the gang members come up to me and shook my hand and said juby it's good to see you man or i think it is and he turned around and walked away because i guess he could feel the 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 uh, suspense towards me not wanting to cuddle up to him and, and, and loving up to him, even though he was the very one that wanted to bury me by coming to the courthouse. And, and first they wanted to whip my tail. And, and then after that, they wanted to turn me into the, to the federal uh, authorities there. That way they could get a little star in their hat. Well, how am I supposed to feel whenever one of their leaders of their gang members walks up to me and shakes my hand? You know, I went and shook my hand. I shook his hand. I greeted him. Hey, how you doing? Oh, okay. Uh, uh, I was in your area. Just thought that uh, that I would uh, take care of some business while I was over here. Oh, I see. You're just in the Waverly area for a while. What difference does it make if I'm here for a while or if I decide to come there indefinitely? I will say this. At least he was bold enough or, you know, had enough fortitude about him to walk up and try to shake my hand. And greet me, but once more, um, the greeting was very, very despair uh, within a 30 second period and walked away uh, saying, Well, I hope that it was good seeing you again. Anyways, later on that day, because I kicked around in the Waverly area, I went above the Waverly area in the town where the, the initial storm actually began. I picked up a report there where one, one person got 23 and a half inches of rain in that period of time and another uh, electrical. Um, digital uh, rain gauge picked up 24 and a quarter inches of rain in that little town and while I was in there um, I got acquainted with one of the people that worked there in town it sold a lot of antique stuff a lot of old stuff and in coming back I wanted to come back in through Henry County or Benton County and I wound up going over the ferry and I could tell it was showering just a little bit off and on uh, while me waiting on the ferry. And then, of course, I got on the ferry and went across the Tennessee River there. And um, as soon as I got off the ferry, it commenced to raining and raining and raining. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because of the flood war warnings that I'm, that, I'm, that I'm seeing at the bottom of the screen. I know it had to have rained at least three and a half to four inches of rain in less than an hour. I mean, it was coming down in, in buckets to the point that my little old car was going through some areas of water that had to have been halfway uh, 
to, to, the, to the top of my tires pertaining to the floodwaters that was just coming down in buckets. And it's just remarkable in how that these super storms now come up out of nowhere and, and flood these areas pertaining to that. Now we're going to watch a little bit of this pertaining to Face the Nation. Once more, uh, my condolences to a former leader pertaining to Gorbachev, which once more, I hope that I won't have to apologize in the hereafter world pertaining to the way that my citizens, pertaining to the way that the so-called church community over here in America basically rejected this message that put us all in where we are today. But if I do, I'll gladly walk up to him in the spirit world and I'll say, Brother, I tried my very best to get this message out to the general public, but I was hated because of it. And they basically killed my brother on account of it. And if that be the case, then that be the case towards me walking up to Gorbachev and apologizing for their own actions here in America and in Northwest Tennessee. Republican nominees for governor and election deniers, evangelists of the big lie. Some of the CBS News election expert, David Becker. What's really important for voters to understand is our process is actually as secure and transparent and professional as it's ever been. And yet since the 2020 election, at least 39 states changed or updated voting laws, often spurred by invented claims of widespread election fraud. Texas imposed new ID requirements for mail-in ballots. Georgia restricted drop boxes and absentee ballots. Florida established an elections crime unit. Yet come election day, November 8th. For most voters, they're going to find that the experience is very similar um, to, 20, uh, to 2020. The bigger worry, what comes next? More January 6th outrage? Claims of election rigging. Crowds baying for blood. potentially encouraged by candidates who may refuse to lose. Our research shows in these six battleground states, in this November's elections for offices that help certify elections, 53 of 88 Republican candidates are election deniers. That's 60 percent. In Arizona's four major Republican primaries, steel champions won all of them, worrying other Republicans there. This cannot be accepted because uh, our democracy cannot withstand it. So we have to continue to push back. Like many election deniers, Doug Mastriano says as governor, he would have refused to certify Joe Biden won Pennsylvania. He was in the crowd on January 6th. With or without new election laws, every state's chief election officer has to certify results. Usually, that's the secretary of state. And this November, a number of conservative candidates running for that office are also election deniers. Major? Mark Strassman in Atlanta, thank you. We're joined now by Maryland Congressman Jamie Raskin, a Democratic member of the January 6th Select Committee. Congressman, good to see you. Good morning. Thanks so much for having me, Major. So, so we have went from environmental deniers, global warm deniers, to now election deniers. This country is so mixed up, it's unbelievable what type of bewitching that has happened here, beginning in the beginning phases that I can go back, I can go back almost 40 years now to 1983 and recognize where the core of origin actually began, right here in Northwest Tennessee. And to think that a group of people was this way goes beyond my understanding. You know, I, I realize that, that times change, methods change, people changes, <clears throat> uh, tactics change. My grandfather was asked by the people, my great-grandfather, Jeffrey Jackson, was asked by the people to be in a dutyator and going around and doing what he'd done towards bringing justice into people into people's lives the way that at that time was permissible by the law but then after world war two after world war one after the stock market fell um society changed and they changed on him and they changed on his concept and they changed by not only 
looking up to him towards him doing his duties the same way that they should have looked upon Buford Pulser, but then they started degrading him and then took advantage of him towards him having to hold up the countryside around here because he was a merchant at that time selling goods and people was losing their shirts because of the 1929 depression. Wasn't no money around. People couldn't pay their taxes. People was losing their farms. And the next thing you know, my own great-grandfather had to declare bankruptcy to hang on or manage what he had. And at one time to think that he was looked up to people because at that time, the people depended upon people like him, either judges or sheriffs, to be able to help to clean up the country. To think that we have gone backwards the way that we have, especially since the assassination of Martin Luther King, and to think that we have sat idly back for the past 30 some odd years and watched this country basically uh, be thrown to the wolves or, or, go, or basically uh, going to hell in a handbasket the way that uh, George Walter H. Bush uh, basically predicted that it would after, after uh, one of their international um, evangelists got caught with a prostitute, Jimmy Swagger. It's just unbelievable of the sickeningness that has occurred here if you'll put it all together in the right perspectives with the drugs, the drug lords, the overdoses, the suicides, our, our prisons being full, um, 30 plus trillion dollars in debt, uh, all the corruption, uh, all the gun violence pertaining to the school shootings and etc. It's it's just absolutely sickening to see where at one time we was, and then to realize how that the people can turn upon those that they hired to do a good job, and they rather have a penny any judge and a penny any sheriff to think that this is going to correct the problems in their neighborhoods or in their communities is absolutely asinizing, to say the least. And whenever I look and I say the things that I say pertaining to it couldn't have happened to a better group of people pertaining to all the uh, baby boomers and, and the free love uh, Woodstock and the, and the drug culture and the free sex culture and all the other different things, that they was willing to accept other than the truth and other than coming down on immoral activity, it couldn't have happened to a better group of people. My only problem is at the age of 61, I feel so, so sorry for the children and the children's children that didn't have nothing to do with this movement, didn't have nothing to do with this travesty, that now they've gotten caught up in this whirlwind to the degree that now they're suffering too as well. Just like the children that died in the in the Texas shooting uh, this year, right before school let out, um, you know, to think that twenty something lives, and that this is just one event, suddenly got taken over somebody with an AR or some kind of a high advanced uh, um, military style gun. To think that that occurred in America is absolutely sickening. It's not only frightfully. Frightful, but it's sickening to think that the core of origin began right here in 1983 in a little town called Kenton, Tennessee. So I hope and pray that those townsmen over there, uh-huh, the ones that's old now, that, that's already done retired, and they're sitting back, and they're living out the rest of their remaining years, their golden years, pertaining to them retiring, and, and they've, they've succeeded in, in, in paying for their houses and paying for their cars, and they got a little bit of money stuff back. I just hope and pray that they can live with themselves on a day-to-day -day level because they're going to have to give an account beginning with the Crosses and the Neals and the Sandersons and all the above, they're going to have to give an account for the big play <clears throat> that now has suddenly seduced the American people's lives in the degree that we're seeing so much sorrow and so much misery. It's pathetic is what it is. It's the same group of people that Davy Crockett 
stood up to and said, I don't care what you're going to do. You can all go straight to hell as far as I'm concerned. I'm going to Texas and I'm going to fight for my independence as well as yours. Our democracy, our republic. And of course, if you know anything at all about history, we know that he went down there and got killed. But the fact of the matter is, he was least willing to go down there and do that for us. That's the reason why the people like Davy Crockett and, and Daniel Boone and some of the old pioneers, they need to be looked up to. Because that was who that we was supposed to have been. We was not supposed to have resignated our, our uh, uh, transition to the people that we are today. We should have been just like Davy Crockett, all of us, towards being willing to lay down our lives for that in which what we knew that was right. I praise our first responders. I praise our, our military of those that's willing to, to uh, put forth uh, that type of, of uh, fortitude. But that's like only, what, two and a half, three percent of all the Americans and the rest of them are sitting in the back seat towards that. Wow. Lots of secretaries of state of both parties as well as election officials. We're going to move forward here because this is all politics. I'm not into politics. I'm really not. I know sometimes people think that I am, but I'm really not. I'm not running for election. I don't want to be in, in no type of uh, seat in, in election. And I, I understand <laughs> me. that the true godliness of God actually contradicts the, uh, the way of most people's lives because most people want to satisfy themselves more so than satisfying God. And that is the truth, rather not people that listen to this want to accept it or not, but most people in general, even those that claim to be Christians, want to satisfy themselves more so than satisfying God. And if they can't accept that, well then that's, that's because once more they're part of the deniers. They're probably part of the people that started out being the the climate deniers, and now they went from the climate deniers to the to the uh, election deniers. Welcome back to Face the Nation. We turn now to Deval Patrick, former governor of Massachusetts, who before that led the Justice Department's Civil Rights Division during the Clinton administration. He joins us this morning from Richmond, Massachusetts. Governor, thanks for making time. Good to see you. It's a pleasure. Good morning. So you're out of politics now. Your focus at the Kennedy School at Harvard is on leadership. How comfortable were you with President Biden's speech last week and also a speech that Republicans well remember that the president gave earlier this year when he compared changes that Republicans made in voting laws in Georgia to Jim Crow and violent enforced segregation of another era? Are you comfortable with that kind of rhetoric? You know what? Um, a friend of mine says that we've been treating our democracy for a long time in this country as if uh, it would tolerate limitless abuse without breaking. And uh, when you add up the 19 states and their vote suppression laws recently, and you uh, look at that alongside the amount of money, so much of a dark, which has been permitted into our politics and our policy making, the radical purging uh, rules, the, the ways in which we have distorted uh, the democratic process as a means to achieve better lives for citizens, it is deeply worrisome and it's gotten worse because of election deniers. So I celebrate the president's uh, speech. You know, any one of us would choose different words, but I think it is great that the president, first of all, calls things what they are and, uh, and also reminds us that the purpose of democracy is a means to assure uh, liberty and justice for all. And we have to care about that process and that purpose for those reasons. Governor, in our focus group that our audience will see in a few moments of Trump supporters, one pointed out that Democrats... And of course, if you know anything at all about my life towards me coming back to Tennessee in 2014, I think that anybody that studies this and which what occurred pertaining to Jeffrey uh, David Jeffrey Jackson's life, as well as Dennis James Jackson's life, known as Juby, that if you study towards what went on uh, within a three-year period of, of 20 and 14, leading up to my brother's death in 20 and 17, and then what happened shortly after 20 and 17, I think if you look at this 
and analyze this and decipher this, especially taking all the taking into an account towards all the telephone calls that was made to the sheriff's office in that three-year period of time, taking into account towards how many times we stood in front of Tommy Moore pertaining to the problem that was being uh, um, illegitimately thrown upon to us, this, this great burden that was thrown upon to us. Uh, I know that you'll be able to understand that we was let down by the judicial system here in this area, and of course, what better people to let us down was the very people that initiated the movement beginning all the way back in the 1983 and in the 1988, whenever I first stood out into the eyes of the general public. That's the reason why I say that the fault falls upon the feet of those that could have done something in the so-called church communities, the uh, baby boomers, uh, they chose to stand idle uh, they chose to basically stick their hands in the sand. And even to this day, me meeting up with a person that's an investigator over about 12 or 15 different states that lives here in Weekly County that acted like that he was my friend. There towards the last, I realized what type of a friend that he truly was by some of the stuff that was going on in their personal lives. And also, whenever I confronted them about me, their response was, we're not neither, Juby. We're not for you, and we're not against you. In other words, we don't stand for the things that the windmill ministry stands for, and we're not against the things that, that the windmill ministry stands for. Playing that lukewarm, fence-straddling position that God himself says that he hates in the first part of Revelations. Once more, this individual is a few years older than me. I think he's 65, 66. Um, he recently got engaged in an accident down in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, totaled out one of his one of his uh, transport vehicles that he works in. And, you know, with friends like that, I continue to keep telling myself, with friends like that, who needs enemies? With friends like that, who needs enemies? And these people, they want to latch on to me kind of like the United Pentecostal people, and they'll tell me that they love me, they tell me that they like me, they'll tell me that, that they support me in a whispering type way, but then whenever it comes time to me to take the leadership role, oh, no, no, you can't do that. We're, we, don't, we don't support you in these matters, Juby. Well, okay, then if you don't support me, then you're against me. Let's, let's call it like it is. Because there is no lukewarm. There is no gray areas pertaining to even what Jesus said. Jesus said, for he who is with me cannot be against me. Because the disciples had met upon this person that they obviously didn't like or they didn't understand. And because of it, they was going to pray fire down on top of this guy's head. And, and Jesus looked at him and said, you know what, not what spirit that you're from. For he that is with me cannot be against me. And I've been for the Lord Jesus Christ since day one. Going all the way back before 1983, whenever the car rolled over on top of me. I got I, I accepted the Lord into my life in, in 1973 or 1974 over here in Sidonia, First Baptist Church. I mean, the proof is in the pudding towards the, towards the interest and the fortitude and the energy that I put forth to put out this message. And, of course, the proof is in the pudding towards how that the Americans especially the so-called church Americans, still to this day, are not supporting the windmill ministries. Now, they'll tell you we love Juby. They'll tell you we want peace. But their actions prove otherwise, just like the investigator and his wife, because they had me on three-way, and I was listening to his wife at the same time that I was listening to him. And basically, they both agreed, we're not for you, we're not against you, we're in the middle. Well, you know what? If that's, if, that's the, um, if that's the anchoring type, let me get my words thought out here real quick. Burdensome mean, burdensome mean, um, 
event that you want to play on towards basically being a hindrance to the ministry by you thinking that you're going to just kind of chum up to me a little bit, but you're not going to get serious about the things that I'm serious about, well, then I don't need that. I'd rather you just stay away from me and go about your business because we know whose fault that this is. And the young people, the people that's got hooked on drugs, obviously they can't see this or they don't care how that the elderly people have stole their, their, their future and stole their children's future and their children's children's future pertaining to this corruption, pertaining to this uh, travesty that has occurred. Because the younger people from, I'm going to say my son's age, from 40, 40, I think my son's 43, uh, that was born in 1979, they should be the ones that should be embracing the windmill ministries towards understanding that, yes, it was the boomers. It was the adult society that, put, that has put us where we are today. But once more, have I seen anybody come out here and try to make amends? Nope. So it validates in the opposite way that a good person can make a mistake, but it takes a better one to admit it. I cannot find nobody that's willing to admit to their mistakes pertaining to how that they handled the founder of the Windmill Ministries, beginning in O'Brien County in Kenton, Tennessee, and leading into the final events that occurred that basically led into David Jeffrey Jackson's life at the age of 51 that to this day still cannot get no type of confirmation towards. That'd be all right. You know what? If you can live with it, I can live without it. I hope that you're proud of yourselves, Kenton, Tennessee. I hope that you're proud of yourselves, Land Between the Lakes, uh, Western Kentucky, Paducah, Kentucky, Benton, Kentucky, uh, Grand Rivers, Kentucky, Livingston County, Kentucky, Marshall County, Kentucky, uh, Murray, Kentucky. I hope that you're proud of yourselves, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. I hope that you're proud of yourselves, Weekly County. Because you may convince others towards what kind of a grand good job that you've done. But in reality, all you've done is place a stumbling block in front of the American people and in, in the world. And one day you'll give an account for it. One day you'll give an account for this injustice that has occurred, not only here in America, but throughout the world. Because you have basically been a part of placing a stumbling block, even as Jesus taught that the attorneys, woe be unto the attorneys, because they had the knowledge that they understood the Bible and that they can understand the interpretations of the Bible. And they know that what I'm teaching and preaching is backed up in the Bible, but yet no, they themselves refuse to go in. That's the reason why God said, woe be unto them, just like woe be unto the psychiatric doctors, because they're the ones that want to treat people with uh, large portions of medication. They want to chemically seduce them. That way they can be in control of their lives, and they can control them uh, with this sorcery type of, of uh, movement that began, I guess, going all the way back to the 12th, 11th or 12th century over in England, back whenever they was uh, doing these things and throwing people off in dungeons and keeping them drugged up all the time and doing electrical shock on them and uh, doing a, a, a trigonoscopy on them where they cut the vein going to the brain where basically they're just basically um, human zombies walking the like kind of like the walking dead you know to do people that way uh is absolutely a disgrace unless that person is out of their mind and they're constantly in 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 some sort of a threat or they're a threat to themselves or they're taking their fist and they're beating against the wall or trying to chew their hands or their fingers off or they're trying to kill other people unless that person is involved in that you need to go about treating that person in a different way now, granted, if they are doing those things, yeah, and that's the only way that you can confine them and keep them restrained, well, then I guess the worst-case scenario would, would apply. But I don't think it applied in my life because I wasn't a violent person. What triggered them 
was the subject matter in which what I was teaching on pertaining to the book of Revelations. Because if you analyze the book of Revelations pertaining to end time events, it does project violence. Either violence by man, violence by nature, or violence in general speaking. And that's what triggered people in trying to put me in the same category as the subject matter in which I have been teaching now for 30 some odd years, and that backfired on them too as well. So in the meantime, I hunker down, I dig in, I sit back, and I watch these extreme weather events, and I watch these extreme horrible political events exacerbate and grow worse and worse and worse and worse, just as Jesus taught that it would be as a woman traveling with her birth pains, that they start coming closer together and they're more and they're more intense as she's getting closer to labor. So that's where we are as a society. And certain people to this day, either in Kentucky, Tennessee, or Oklahoma, has yet to get it turned around. So if people want to continue to stay engaged in this in this uh, travesty that has occurred here, well, then they need to continue to do what they've been doing, which is nothing, uh, sitting on their hands and not engaging. And I guarantee you, coming near a neighborhood near you, it's just a matter of time before the hardship will fall up into your lives too as well. Do I take pleasure in saying these things? No, not at all. A matter of fact, it's very, very sor sorrowful in what society has brought up into itself. Once more, we're dealing with a bunch of lunatics. We're dealing with a group of people that thought it was okay of the Woodstock era, the free love era, the free drug era, all the other different types of movements that happened during that time and, and you know, throughout the 50s and the 60s and the 70s that has put us where we are today. Killing all these unborn children, over 60 million children unborn, here in America, their lives has been taken, and you don't think that people's going to have to give an account for that? Thousand, and they wouldn't let them go. They raised objections in 2004, so they wouldn't let them go. And in 2016, raised objections and wouldn't let them go. And they consider Democrat criticism of Republican objections to what they saw in 2020 hypocritical. Respond to that. Well, I think it's important for us to hear that, first of all, and to uh, and really try to process that. I think I experience that differently. I think when, when Donald Trump, if what you mean is uh, objections to Donald Trump winning the presidency, I don't think there was any Democrat calling the, uh, the election itself illegitimate because the outcome was surprising or disappointing uh, to Democrats. I think it is important, though, to acknowledge that there is frustration that runs pretty deep uh, throughout the political spectrum about democracy as a path to a better future. And that is because I think we've been treating it uh, in, this, uh, in these kind of careless ways for a long, long time. It's a whole other order of magnitude, and that is serious enough, but a whole order, other order of magnitude to say that uh, democracy is illegitimate uh, unless the outcome... It's a rebellious movement pertaining to a bunch of people over here in America that's been spoiled towards getting their ways, and because things don't go according to the way that they had planned, they refuse to let it go. That's what it is. It's a group of people that is so dead set that they're willing to get their way even at the expense of destroying everybody else's life in exchange to get their way. And that's basically what I'm dealing with pertaining to the so-called church society, you know, I sit back and I wonder, how far are you willing to go before you actually see our country completely torn apart? Not just parts of it, but our country torn apart completely. And, of course, whenever I got engaged in the United Pentecostal People's Lives over here in Union City for the third and final time, I realized how far that they was willing to go. They was willing to go all the way to the max. In other words, it didn't matter to them if the world did blow up. They wasn't going to. They wasn't going to support Juby. They wasn't going to admit to any wrongs that happened to Juby. They wasn't going to get in behind the Windmill Ministries uh, 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 to support the founder of the of of uh, 
somebody that had been anointed by God in regards to this. And I seen that and I identified that. And you know what? I backed out of that. It's like, you know what? I've done already played that game. I went to that sequence. I got the t-shirt. Um, I went on about my business and I don't want to do that again. And I don't. Because all they are is playing time. They're playing time because they got so much pride, they're not willing to admit of, of any of their wrongs at the expense of everybody else's failures. And it's really wicked. It's really wicked in how that people are willing to do this at other people's expense simply because we do not have the people here in America no more pertaining to a good person can make a mistake, but it takes a better one to admit to that mistake pertaining to there is no more better people. It pretty well cuts the tide between the so-called good and the real good to the point that there is no, no longer any real good. Because if it was, I truly believe that somebody would have engaged into my life other than telling me, well, we're not for you and we're not against you. We're lukewarm. We're in the gray area, Juby. We just want to hang around you. We kind of feel sorry for you. Even though we know that you have this anointed, even though we can read the Bible and understand it for ourselves, and we know that the things that you're teaching is head on, is, is, is head on hitting the target, but yet, no, you still don't see them coming over here and, and actually pursuing a movement. So, as things fall apart, as things get worse, I sit back, and I put my little thumb Trump on my nose. Have, uh, I put uh, my little him. thumb on my nose and I say, nanny, nanny, boo, boo, nanny, nanny, boo, boo. It couldn't have happened to a better group of people. You brought this misery and sorrow up into your own lives and now you brought it up into the lives of the innocent. Nanny, nanny, boo, boo. Is what I'm hunkered down and dug in towards. And in the meantime, I'm still living my life, and I'm still getting evaluations, and I'm still getting uh, different uh, testimonies from different people about different things. I'm still evaluating people. You know, they can evaluate me all they want. I don't care. I'm not perfect. I can't turn water into wine. I can't walk on water, and I've never raised a dead. But that don't mean that I won't one day. Uh, of the country and were undeniable uh, in the experience we all shared going through uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. I think that the notion of being engaged, of, uh, of taking responsibility for, uh, um, for this generation and generations to come is enormously important and encouraging. And one of the things I try to uh, encourage in them is that they look for and think about and reject the false choices that so many of our would-be leaders um, uh, tell us. You know, you don't have to hate the uh, the members of another party to be a member in good standing of your own. In the same way, you don't have to hate business to, uh, to advocate for social and economic justice or to hate the police to believe Black Lives Matter. But we are sold so many of these kinds of false choices in our current uh, political discourse and I keep encouraging the young people who want to be involved and who are trying to encourage others of all generations to be engaged to be alert to those false choices and reject them because the fact is most people aren't aren't buying hundred percent of what either party is selling you know that so whenever you're dealing with these stereotypes and that's exactly what they are they're stereotypes they're stereotypes over this they'll stereotype you over that they'll stereotype you over this I mean over here in this Bible Belt area you can't get the, pre the Presbyterians to agree upon the Church of Christ. You can't get the Church of Christ to agree upon the Methodists. You can't get the Methodists to agree upon the Baptists because they all have different philosophies and they all have different covenants. But yet, no, there was only one Jesus that rose from the grave that now sits upon the right hand of the Father. You can't tell me that these people hadn't been bamboozled. They're hoodwinked. They have been bewitched and they still are under this bewitching spirit. In other words, God has given them over to a reprobate mind and let them believe a lie to be damned. In the meantime, their their communities are falling apart. Their own personal lives is falling apart. Uh, their daughters and their granddaughters are being impregnated by by uh, 
uh, people that they don't want to be impregnated by, uh, towards drug dealers and etc. And it's just steadily going backwards each and every second of each and every day. In the meantime, they curl up in their little knots and they go to church supposedly to satisfy their own consciousness. But whenever it comes to them reaching out and helping their fellow man, you still don't see it. You still don't see it. It goes beyond sad. It goes beyond, uh, it goes to the point of being reprobatable. These people have committed uh, a reprobate type sin uh, to the point that it's become blasphemy. And anytime a country gets this far backwards towards taking the truth and turning it into a lie and taking a lie and turning it into the truth, you can expect more hardships to fall upon to that group of people or upon to that society. That's where we are. That's where we're heading. Apparently, they must like it because they're not willing to do nothing about it. Or if they are, I haven't seen the results of it. So let's go on with our lives and see how far that this thing is willing to go before total destruction. Total annihilation. And don't think for a second that God ain't capable of either allowing it to happen or he himself of actually doing it. Because whenever it talks about how in the book of Revelations in the first three or four chapters that he will throw us off in the great tribulation, it don't say that he will allow for man to throw us off in the great tribulation. It doesn't say that he will allow for the Luciferian Lucifer, the Antichrist, to throw us off in the great tribulation. It says that he will come back and destroy those who are destroying the earth and will throw this great planet off into great tribulation. No prawns, no cons, no, I mean, it's it's direct to the, to the very fabric of what he's talking about. Information. It appears to be politically motivated, but there's no way to be sure because we don't work for the FBI. We don't work for the Biden administration. They're not going to leave him alone. So even if he has done something wrong, uh, they'll always be trying to, to go after him for something, and it'll be the focus. I believe that if it really was about documents, that it could have been handled between the lawyers as it had been being handled. Um, you don't... Re what it's really about... The what it's really about, it's about an individual that refused to be bought off, paid off, like Mike Wilson was for nine terms, even though his, his uh, county here in the state of Tennessee was steadily going backwards. That really is what it amounts to. Now, there are certain things that Donald Trump took a part of that even I disagreed with. But there's a whole lot of things that Donald Trump done that I did agree with. Especially whenever it comes to draining the swamp. And that's what so many people are afraid of. They're afraid that they're going to lose their positions. They're afraid that they're going to be identified. They're afraid that they're going to be exposed. And we can't have somebody like Donald Trump or Juby Jackson coming in here and doing that. <clears throat> that's basically a dropout that didn't complete high school, much less go to college. We can't have Jesus Christ coming in here. 2,000 years plus years ago and telling the Pharisees and the Philistines how that they was serpents, how that they was dogs, how that they was nothing more than than cold tingling uh, rinkets uh, of hypocrites that wanted to clean the outside of the cup but wasn't concerned about cleaning the inside of the cup. There's a pattern here. And people need to look at the pattern and the pattern is the same type of pattern that has happened again and again and again throughout basically all the prophets, all the messengers, and even the very Son of God. There's a pattern here towards where we are to this day that, like I said, I guess to expect for them to raise a white flag and surrender or to come to an agreement pertaining to this Mexican standoff that's occurred, you're only fooling yourself if you're expecting for the bad people to clean up their act and acknowledge they're bad and try to turn this around towards the good. I, I even keep thinking, you know, like, like, like God, you know, 
pronounced death to Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, he started out, if there's 100 people, if there's 50 people, if there's 25 people, if there's 10 people, if there's 5 people, if there's 1 person, I won't do it. But he couldn't even find the 1 person. And that's why he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, and that will be the very reason why that he cast this, this nation and this world off in the Great Tribulation is simply because of the very same fundamentals. Remember the instances you describe them? You describe them accurately. But I remember a phrase that my grandmother used to use, which is two wrongs don't make a right. And I wonder how you process that wisdom from my grandmother in this context. I think two wrongs don't make a right, but I don't think hypocrisy is very flattering as well. Joanne, uh, about two wrongs don't make a right. I understand that there is a history on both sides. I'm just wondering if you're comfortable and if you have any anxiety about the future of democracy if both sides use that as an excuse against one another and we never get anywhere. You're absolutely correct. If every side is going to say after they were, lose, we really didn't lose, then, yeah, I mean, elections will become something that nobody's ever going to be happy with. You just said the, the question of democracy, mm -hmm. but isn't democracy arguing, debating? Um, so if the president has been said that you can question elections, I mean, you can question everything in the democracy. Sure. So it's getting to somebody like me, um, who's not a Republican or a Democrat, but I do support Trump. It's getting really old hearing democracy, 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 because what we're doing is part of a democracy. And I want to weigh in on what they just talked about as far as two wrongs don't make a right. Two wrongs doesn't make a right. That's the reason why that our, our ancestors... It just means that... Our ancestors put it, into the, put it into the clause pertaining to the Constitution that if our government is no longer providing the needs for the American people, then the American people has a right to overthrow that government. To this day, I mean, our government has passed out how many trillions of dollars worth of stimulus checks? To this day, uh, the administration that's in there right now uh, are on top of their game towards, towards cutting this and cutting that and doing this and doing that. So until all them avenues de deplete and are no longer in existence, then the American people cannot say that the American government is no longer providing for people's needs because it is. It's only whenever all of it collapses, and then you got a right to become violent towards going up against uh, those that refuse to let go of these positions that obviously have been been adapted to that don't want to uh, release these positions, su such as you know, I guess Mike Wilson, if he would have got in the press, if he would have got in into the uh, uh, public arena uh, a little bit earlier in his life, uh, I guess that he would probably run again for this election and win and probably even the next election to win. Probably the only reason why he's giving it up is because he realized what kind of a bad job that he's made uh, pertaining to the failures of the, of the, of the Weekly County so, uh, so, Society here in Weekly County, or it's just that his body has become so riddled to the point that he no longer wants to worry about waking up every morning and cleaning up and, and coming to work and putting on that false facade and, and that little nice white shirt and, and, and looking very attractive in the eyes of the public. I don't know which one or the other, but the bottom line is this. Yes, these people that are in these positions, like, like uh, Nancy Pelosi and others that's been in power for years and years and years, basically the only way to run them out is to let the clock run out on them towards them either dying, retiring, or at the worst case scenario, if the government was to completely uh, collapse to the point that it could no longer provide the needs of the people, then actually take up arms to be able to uh, uh, start a new uh, system, to start a new government with a new alliance. I don't support violence, but I do support this, that if our government turns on the people, then the people has a right to turn on the government. Now that I do have, now that I do support. If the government, for some reason, and it don't matter if it's the American government, the Russian government, the China government, uh, the Honduras government, the Cuban government, that if the government turns on the people, the people has a right to turn on the government. That 
I support. Um, I don't want to destroy democracy. Um, I want this country to be great again. Um, that's what I want. And that's all it means. That's right? all that anybody wants in their right mind. America great again. And that is something that I'd like to see happen um, hopefully sooner rather than later. Well said. And thank you for listening to me. And we'll be back. And if the truth be known, that was Donald Trump's original concept. But just to go in there and wave a magic wand and think that it's all going to be drained or taken care of overnight, it ain't going to. And that's what's gotten Donald Trump in trouble is that he has pursued in avenues that he should not have pursued in. And because of it, they're going to hold his feet to the fire. They're going to make him walk the plank. I agree 100% that the swamp needs draining. And ordinarily, to be successful in any swamp, in any government, you got to start at the top and work your way all the way down to the county officials, to the county level. You don't start from the bottom and go to the top. You start from the top and go to the bottom. That's how you, you know, you cut, you, you, you cut the snake's head off. You got to start from the, uh, you're beating a horse on the wrong end. You got to start at the right end. But in engaging in all this, I don't know what, what's going to become of this particular show right here because I'm dealing with uncertain areas here. I don't even know what they're going to promote here. Let's see real quick if we're still on politics or what. So, you know, as long as the business model of the Internet is built around trying to captivate audiences and keep them clicking, reacting, whether that's through rage or diehard support. Uh, it, it, it's going to be in conflict with democracy because democracy is not about what gets the most attention. It's supposed to be about you know what the best ideas are, how do we compromise, how do we move forward. Um, in this attention-based economy... I disagree with that because the Internet can be a very, very good tool for a democracy if it is governed the right way. But whenever you have social media platform providers like Facebook or whoever out there that basically allows for any and everything to go and there is no uh, guardrails in what people can say and what they can't say and what, what uh, is acceptable and what isn't, isn't acceptable, then you have chaos. That's where we are right now with our internet uh, platform uh, platform uh, users. Uh, we got chaos. People are out there. They decide what they want to consume. There is agency, as you indicated. So the internet isn't a problem. These people are out there. They have their beliefs, and they're going to pursue it. Or is it that you're arguing the internet is an accelerator and a multiplier? It's an accelerator and a multiplier. Um, this kind of content, conspiratorial content, uh, extremist move. Once more, it was the government that allowed for this to come onto the scene, that dumped this in people's laps, that now is nothing more than chaotic. Um, you know, in, in a way, I, I know it's wrong by Saudi Arabia, not allowing for the internet to be over there towards people having access. And there's other countries that uh, basically have done the same thing towards not allowing their people to uh, be hooked up to these uh, worldwide events. But in a way, I can understand the reason why that they don't is because they're trying to protect their better interests within their own country. Now, I don't agree with Saudi Arabia. I don't agree with their government ethics. I don't agree with the way that they handle their situation. I don't agree with... Uh, uh, their humanitarian rights. I don't agree with none of the above. A matter of fact, if anything, I, I'm thinking that they're the evilest of, of most evil, and they're the ones that masterminded 9-11 that can be proven. But the point being is that they're smart enough to identify a potential problem or danger, and because they don't want to have to go through the same type of scenario that now other countries are going through on account of the Internet, they steer away from it. They don't want that Trojan horse. They don't want something that looks like it's the best thing that's been created since toilet paper and now that's going to wind up biting the very institutions that they're a part of. Do I agree with their institutions? No. 
but I do agree with the concept of how that they have chosen to protect those institutions. But I feel like that they go overboard in being too strong, too headstrong, and, and, and I feel like that they could set up some sort of a, the guardrails to the extent that, uh, that they would be able to engage towards what was fair and what wasn't fair, what was right, what wasn't right uh, in their government. And, and, of course, and, of course, whenever it comes to trying to dominate your, your citizens, whenever it comes to you trying to control the very thought pattern that's going on in people's, uh, people's minds and in people's hearts, well, then you have went beyond the rim of what is right, and now... You are enslaving them, people, rather than giving them their independence or giving them their dignity and their independence. And that's exactly what places like Saudi Arabia, Russia, China, just to mention a few, that's exactly what they're doing to their citizens. They're going beyond the, the, the pale and wanting to control every aspect of their lives, including their feelings and including their thoughts. In other words, those people in those countries are basically enslaved to their government and their government is in control of every aspect of their lives. Once more, you're going from the far left to the far right and the far right in how that they're controlling uh, these media platforms are going too far. We're not far enough and they've gone too far. So where is the happy medium? Where is the center point of what's going to be acceptable towards what people can say, how that they can say it, who that they can say it to? Well, we're in the birth pains right now of this new invention that has been invented for the past 25 years of the social media platforms. And because of it, we're going through the birth pains of it. Once more, you can take the Internet and become one of the most potential tools that ever has been uh, designed, or you can take the internet and weaponize it and turn it into one of the worst things that's ever coming into existence of the world. NAACP President Derek Johnson, great conversation. Thank you so much for joining me. An arrest in the kidnapping of a Tennessee heiress taken while jogging, but what has happened to her, that still remains a mystery. That was quick and rewarding. I, heard I think that was an incident that happened down in Memphis, if I'm not mistaken, where some girl got abducted. I'm pretty sure they probably killed her and probably throw her body off in a river or, or exposed the body. Uh, I'm just thinking that's probably what happened. It ain't. It hadn't fully uh, surfaced yet towards what has happened, other than they've got the person supposedly that done this. Good luck to each and every one of us as we end our program by saying God bless you for listening. God bless your concerns. God bless your prayers. Um, God bless America and America's endeavors. God bless our, our troops. And on this Sunday morning, September the 4th, I think it is, 2022, we want to say shalom and may heaven help us all.